Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and who better to talk about this topic than Dr. Ron Weiss? He's a doctor, he's a farmer, and he's passionate about this subject. Please welcome him back to the show. It's always good to see you, Dr. Weiss. It's always wonderful to be with you, Chef AJ. Yeah, well, so you're a guy, and yeah. you don't have boobs. Well, I mean, you do, but you know what I mean. So why is this topic so important to you? Mm. Well, it's important to me. Uh, let me backtrack a little bit uh, and just say that there are uh, maybe a, a couple of percent of all the breast cancer cases in America do occur in men. And when breast cancer does occur in men, it's particularly devastating and has a high death rate because it's, it's usually not picked up very early. So I just wanted to get right out there and say that so that people are aware of that. Um, but, you know, breast cancer, particularly in my life has had a great impact. Um, and that's because the two, the two cancer cases that we've had in my family occurred about the time that I had just become a a newly minted doctor. And one of the cancer cases was in my father who had uh, end stage pancreatic cancer. The other case was in my 42 year old uh, cousin, first cousin, Barbara Dworkin. And um, no one had ever had these cancers in my family before. I was a, a young doctor, just got out of training, you know, could help the world. Um, uh, you know, could do anything in my power. And I was brought to my knees uh, by the realization that I was uh, completely feckless and, and couldn't, there was little, I thought little I could do to help my own family. So in, in, and I can tell you about my cousin's story a little bit, but uh it ended up being that I, in many ways, in both the cancer cases occurred at the same time. I was, um, I was in many ways, much more deeply offend, uh, affected by my cousin's case than my father's case, both uh, ended in death. And it was because she was so young. You know, my father was an elderly gentleman I guess you got to die of something at some point. And, you know, we expect old people to get cancer. We don't expect people in the prime of their productive life all of a sudden to be diagnosed and die within 18 months of a, of a terrible metastatic disease. And that was my cousin. And I'm so sorry about that. And I didn't mean to minimize breast cancer in men. I actually have a friend who had it, but it must be, I mean, because men don't go for regular screenings. Like they don't, and it's 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 uh, never suspected and not looked for at all. Uh, and we can talk about screening in a second, but um, yeah, it's just it's not thought about. Yeah, yeah. So how? Yeah, exactly. So you know what? what it's on the increase, right? Breast cancer, all cancers, but in particular, breast cancer. Well, <laughs> well uh, let me put it this way. Uh, you know, I graduated Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School in 1988, and I specifically remember that when I was in the last year of medical school, the data came out that one in every 11 women in America um, would get breast cancer in her lifetime. Today, it's one in eight, which is an astonishing increase. And the question is, why is that? That was my next question. Why, why is that? Well, um, you know, you and I come from a, a food, a plant-based food world, right? And we know how powerful food is in uh, the prevention and treatment of disease, all diseases, not just breast cancer. Uh, but um, so a lot of people, I guess, uh, reflexively in our audience might think, uh -huh, uh huh, uh huh, I know. During the past few decades, as our food systems and and standard American diet have gotten worse and worse and worse, as pollution in our environment and all kinds of chemicals and pesticides have gotten more concentrated, 
in the past few decades, that's what's causing the cancer. But that is not clear. And, um, uh, and probably is not the case. It's, it's not the reason why there's a rising incidence of breast cancer, because really, to, to, I mean, you, you'd have to go through some extraordinary lengths to have uh, and changes uh, uh, drastically in our food and environment to have that kind of outsized increase in incidence, right? I mean, that's, that's huge from one in 11 to one in eight. And really what we, what we seems to be the cause is breast cancer screening. Yeah, we are, we are getting more and more powerful in our abilities and, and invasive through screening mammograms and techniques to identify breast cancers when maybe we should not. Maybe we should not be doing that. And there's growing evidence that in, in fact, that this may not be a positive uh, thing for us to do. Yeah, I know that that's what Dr. McDougall has been saying for years. Yeah, yes, Dr. McDougall was an early, uh, an early messenger, uh, an early promoted this message very early on, yeah. Um, so, uh, in fact, the, the country of Switzerland has, in recent years, um, their national medical board has advised to drop mammogram screening altogether because the data that's come out just does not show, demonstrate that it actually saves lives. Uh, you know, <clears throat> when, uh, when American women were polled or surveyed, uh, the, um, the average American woman seems to think that mammograms reduce her personal chance of getting breast cancer by about 50%. This is not the case at all. And um, there is no clear evidence that it actually reduces death at all, getting these screens. So what, what do you recommend then? Well, I recommend you. I recommend people listen to your show and do what you're telling them to do because, uh, and, and I recommend that people come to our wonderful breast cancer uh, food webinar, which is on Thursday with Dr. Walter Willett, one of the leading um, public health officials in the world from Harvard Medical School, Harvard School of Public Health. And we'll be talking about the specifics and the details of how whole plant foods can really do a much better job, uh, not better, but a good job at preventing breast cancer and even treating it. Uh, and we're also gonna be talking about how the things that are in our diet uh, are causative or, or not causative, are there are certain aspects of the standard diet that are associated with uh, a higher risk. So if you take out the bad things and put in the good things, like you recommend, you end up in a good place in preventing and treating breast cancer. Right, so Amy, who's watching live said, so how, how can cancer be detected if you don't get a mammogram? Huh. Well, that's a very good question. Um, so um, let me, let me back up a little bit um, and say that, um, you know, there, there are three kinds of prevention. And this is one of the first things you learn in medical school. There's primary prevention, secondary prevention, and tertiary pre prevention, right? So what Amy is asking is, how can I secondarily prevent cancer? Secondary prevention is never as strong as primary prevention. Primary prevention means, hey, I don't have the disease of breast cancer and I don't want to get it, right? And that's why we eat whole plant foods and, and uh, adhere to healthy lifestyles because we don't want that breast cancer to be present ever. Mammograms are secondary prevention. Secondary prevention is not as powerful. And what that means is, okay, I have the disease already. I just want to find it before it kills me, right? 
of course, nobody actually wants to find breast cancer. I, I guess you want to find it before it kills you, but you hope when you go for a mammogram that it's negative, right? That you don't have a positive answer. So that's secondary prevention. And to further, you know, further my answer to Amy's question, um, the problem with mammograms is that when we're involved in secondary prevention, in other words, when there are breast cancers already there that, that we're trying to identify with this test, unfortunately, there's a whole bunch of women. Well, let me back up and, and uh, say that it's, it's not clear that the mammogram screening actually, although it can identify the cancers, that it actually saved any women's lives at all. Uh, number two, um, in the group that it identifies the cancers in, a lot of these women would have been better off if they had never gone for the test or never had it identified in the first place. Because we are now realizing that, you know, there are a lot of cancers in us and we don't know about them. Um, there, uh, and that just because we have cancer in us, it doesn't mean it's going to be harmful and kill us. For example, um, there was uh, years ago, there was a study where they took 40 year old women who had died, let's say in car accidents, they died from something else and they autopsied them and they examined their breasts and found that one third of these women had cancers in their breasts which is a huge amount of women, you know, one third of women don't have breast cancer, come down with breast cancer in their life. It's a couple of percent in the United States, which goes to tell you that there are a lot more women than we think that have incipient breast cancer within them. You don't necessarily want to find it because then those patients, those women become breast cancer patients uh, a lot of them undergo surgeries and terrible chemotherapy and radiation, all kinds of things that can cause damage to you, heart failure, other cancers. So uh, that's my complicated answer to Amy's question that you, you don't necessarily want to find it. You know, yeah, there was, um, in the 1990s, 80s, and 90s, there was a wonderful uh, professor at Harvard Medical School by the name of Judah Folkman, who came up with the idea that and promoted this theory, which, is, which has changed the way we think of how cancer develops, that um, as we grow older, probably past the age of 20, we have a lot of cancers in us, but they are, let's say, the size of the tip of this ballpoint pen, very tiny. And as we go through our lives and, and you know, get more DNA damage from our environment and the oxidation of the things we're doing, more and more of these tiny uh, little cancers arise in us, but they just remain tiny unless something sets them off. And our lifestyle has a lot to do and our food with setting them off. So uh, we don't want necessarily want to find those cancers. We just want to eat good food and do other good things to prevent these cancers from uh, grabbing a blood supply, uh, which Dr. Folkman uh, theorized, which came true. And then uh, harnessing the blood supply so that the these tiny little nests of cancers could grow into larger tumors and then metastasize. So how much of cancer in general and breast cancer in particular is genetic? How much is caused by other reasons? And what are those other reasons in your opinion? Well, you know, we think about perhaps five to 10% of breast cancers has a underlying genetic basis. So that means almost 90% of breast cancers are not, they are sporadic. And, and if, you, if you look at most women who 
are the vast majority of women this year who will be diagnosed with a breast cancer from their mammograms. Um, the vast majority don't have any relatives that have ever had breast cancer. And the same was true of Barbara, my cousin. No one in my family ever had breast cancer. Um, so, you know, um, you know, I am Jewish of Eastern European Jewish extraction. Uh, and, you know, I'm not sure, I'm just trying to think how far back she was diagnosed, my cousin, and this was in the early nineties. I'm not sure if they had the BRCA gene yet identified or tests available. And um, however, you know, Ashkenazi women, Jewish women have about maybe a 4% uh, incidence of this gene in them, the BRCA mutation gene. So, um, you know, that, uh, that is a particular example of a, an, uh, of a subset of women who have a genetic, uh, an uh, already identified genetic mutation that puts them at risk. However, you know, in our world of, of whole plant foods, we have a saying, and I think this saying was uh, first spoken by Dr. Esselstyn, that your genes load the bullets into the gun and it's what you eat that pulls the trigger. So um, for many people with genetic predispositions, it's specifically and really important to eat well so that just because you have genes, whether it be genes for breast cancer or genes, everyone in my family had coronary artery disease or diabetes, it doesn't mean that they have to be expressed, right? And you can do things to help yourself. And that's what, you know, eating whole plant foods and lifestyles about. Right. You know, the, the, I want to get into uh, some lifestyle habits in more in depth with you, like alcohol use and, and exercise. But first, one of the questions I have, I have a dear friend whose mother is, let's see, so she's in her 70s and she's been whole food plant based only for the last 10 years. I don't want to say only like to minimize it, but you have to understand that people, you know, they eat what they ate the first, you know, 60 years of their life. And so she noticed um, like a bump, a lump in her breast because she wasn't getting mammograms. You know, we were all doing what Dr. McDougall said to do. I personally don't get them, but I don't judge people if they, I mean, people have to make their own decision with their own breasts, but I stopped having all tests like colonoscopy and mammograms over 20 years ago when I changed my diet from a junk food vegan diet to really what many would consider plant perfect, because what am I going to change? I mean, I already do everything. I don't right. you know, perfectly and diet and exercise and sleep. So I, like you say, I'd rather not know because I kind of try to avoid doctors, but anyway, so my friend's mother found a lump. So she went and they said she had an aggressive stage two cancer. So if somebody has a symptom like that, then would they want to investigate it? Or is it still better left alone instead of doing, in her case, they're not doing surgery, but she's taking a whole bunch of medications that are, you know, making her sick and things like that. So so <laughs> very complex, you, you know, once, once uh, the way it works with uh, medical tests is that it's hard, it's, it's often a slippery slope and it's hard to draw the line on where to stop. It's just like, you, you know, I don't mean to take the name of Dr. McDougall in vain, but it's just like once you eat like one piece of cheese, or you eat one piece of chicken, or you eat one, it's a slippery slope. It, it's hard to stop, right? You continue to slide down hill. And in the same way, when you start getting medical tests, you have to be prepared to know what to do when you get the answer. So, um, you know, uh, so let's take um, your friend's mother. So she felt a lump in her breast, right? Well, mm, she decided to get a mammogram, or I guess the doctor decided. Um, and so once that decision is made, uh, I'm guessing that your friend's mother and the doctor should be prepared to go to the, potentially go to the full extent of diagnosis and treatment, because why else would you be doing the mammogram? I mean, I guess you could stop at some points, like, 
So I, I'm assuming after your friend had the mammogram, they saw an abnormality. The abnormality was biopsied. It was found to be an aggressive tumor, yes? Mm -hmm. And it was in stage two. What would I do? I'd keep going. <laughs> because if it's an aggressive tumor and it's stage two, it means it's going to become stage three. It's going to metastasize, right? It will go to the lymph nodes, then it'll become stage four. Then it's going to go to the bones and it's going to go to the liver. So, you know. And I think it has, I think they saw a couple of spots on the liver, but in, and so, I, you know, I'm playing devil's advocate here. Cause again, I'm not the authority on this. I only am the authority on my body. I choose not to do anything like that. But in her case, would mammogram have saved her life if she had had it earlier? Would they have found it earlier? All this, the Cochrane, Cochrane Review says no. Cochrane Review, all the studies say no. You have to remember something. You know, we look, we have a tendency, you as you look at your friend's mother, me as I look at a patient, this patient, that patient, to look at individuals and we become biased based on these individual stories. Whereas the purpose of these vast population 50,000 foot views is to take thousands and thousands of thousands of women and look at them because in greater numbers, as you survey the data, there's more accuracy, right? There's, there's of, of, uh, and it gives us a better picture across the population of, of what, of what we should be doing. So, um, could mammograms have saved your, uh, or could it have diagnosed uh, your friend's mother at an earlier age, so a stage, so it was only a stage one instead of a stage two? I guess it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have been able to pick up the aggressive aggressivity of the tumor because mammograms don't do that. But possibly, but maybe not. Maybe not. Look at my cousin Barbara, right? Uh, so at the time. Let's say at the time she was diagnosed, she was about 42 years old. The recommendation for mammograms at that time uh, were, and, and they've since been, they've since been uh, um, made less intensive recommendations, was that a woman should get a baseline screening at 35 and then a mammogram at age 40, 42, you know, every year or two through the 40s, and then at 50 every year until you're 120 years old until you're in the cemetery. You just keep going, right? So you know, she had a baseline. <laughs> she had her mammogram at age 35. Didn't help her. She had, I remember specifically, she had had a mammogram like a year or two before that, according to the screenings. It didn't help her. She gets a mammogram at age 42. They find something. It's already spread. It's stage four. Didn't help her. And then when you see such a terrible case and, and her breast cancer was so aggressive that despite all the chemotherapy that gave her, that made her hair fall out, that made her sick for the rest of her days until she died, it, she just had a terrible end. Um, um, you could say, well, if I follow the current guidelines of the US Preventive Services Task Force, right? Um, which say, don't get a mammogram until age 50. Well, Barbara, my cousin would have been completely missed, but look, she was following the guidelines at the time and she was missed anyway. And then when it was even caught, it didn't make a difference. She died a miserable death. So. I'm, I'm mentioning her just to, to, just to mention that, you know, there are specific personal case stories, but that doesn't give you the population view. And for that, we have to look at the studies. Right. Well, thank you. Stephanie says, does having a mammogram awake, if you will, a tumor that may be sleeping and hiding come to form breast cancer? Well, that's a good question, you know, uh, and that's why I tell I guide people, uh, women who have been plant-based whole foods for many years, uh, many years, 
since early adulthood who have no other risk factors to consider not getting mammograms at all. Because personally, I think that they have such a low risk of getting breast cancer that just the radiation from the mammogram can increase their chance of getting breast cancer. I think for the average woman, you know, most of us have been eating standard American diets until at least most people in my age group and my situation until through middle age. So, you know, mammograms, mam the, the regular mammogram screening that's re recommended currently by the United States Preventive Services Task Force, which is, as I said, between uh, after age 50 and until 74 every two years, I generally recommend that for women if you've had a standard diet. But I agree with, with the caller that if you've been doing it for a long time, I think just the radiation exposure alone could increase your risk. Wow, thank you. Well, Amy says, how else can cancer be detected then without a mammogram? And if you don't detect it, it's stage one, won't it just go into stage four? Well, we have no other, currently we have no other ways to detect it other than mammograms. I mean, the, you know, doing self breast exams is not really recommended anymore by the United States uh, Preventive Services Task Force. And by the way, that's the large like authority, the federal committee that makes recommendations on uh, preventive techniques of what we should be doing for our health. And for that, for that matter, even doctors examining your breasts routinely as a regular part of the physical annual physical exam has been done away with too. So we don't have doctor or self exams anymore. The mammograms really is the only screening, secondary screening, right? Not primary. That's why we've got to attack the foods. We've got to go with the primary screening. Isn't there like, primary prevention. Can't, they, can't they check other ways? Some, isn't there something called thermography, I think, that some people get? Yeah, some people, yeah, do. That's sort of an alternative technique, but it's not been, uh, it's surely not, there's not enough evidence to show that it's effective as a screening tool. Wow. Dina says, what about the compression that happens during mammograms? Can that cause breast trauma? I mean, I literally had one once and then I said, I'm not doing this again, but you know, not, not everybody has the ability there. Many of the people watching are female. They're very agreeable. And even if they don't want it, people have a hard time saying no to their doctors. Well, true. Uh, I think people, yeah, because uh, I think uh, there's a concept uh, that patients have that doctors are experts and, and they have an expert role in our lives. And that's true. Um, you know, they have access to data and they, they've been taught to, to, to survey the data, to analyze it and then interpret it and then deliver their recommendations to us based on that data. I mean, lay people really don't have those abilities. So there are a local like personal connection to, you know, evidence-based medicine. So I understand that why they do that. But, you know, the other thing is that, you know, you have to remember there are, you know, there are, there's now like a breast ca cancer industry that's popped up, right? Where every highway you drive on for, for breast, you know, in, during October, at least around here in New Jersey, you'll see giant billboards of all these breast centers, breast cancer centers from the local hospital, reminding everyone, oh, you have to keep getting your mammograms. You have to keep you know, going for this. So, you know, and the hospitals have basically developed these centers as a money-making, uh, a profit center for the hospital to bring in patients. So, you know, there's the influence from that as well. The thing is, is it's just they don't even I don't want to say they, but except for people like you and the doctors that are plant based, it's one thing to, to want to do the test, but they don't even mention prevention, uh, you know, the diet. Know. Prevention. That's, know, what's that's, so the tough. That, that's the part that bothers that's what's me. So tough. The most powerful thing they don't mention. And that's why it's so disturbing. Yeah, that that part really does bother me. You know, walk for the cure, run for the cure. But nobody says eat for the cure. <laughs> No. And, and, and the frustrating thing is 
when people participate in these walking for the cures and running for the cures, the money will most likely go through these organizations that fund, fund uh, you know, more chemo research, <laughs> right? So, but never, never fund, you know, information like we're talking about. Right. Well, what about prevention other than eating a whole food plant-based diet? There are, there are, I'm told other things that are risk factors like being overweight, for example, even if somebody's eating vegan or plant-based carrying excess weight, I'm told can increase cancer. Absolutely. Being, being obese or being overweight is a risk factor for getting all kinds of cancers, including breast cancer. Um, and, um, and of course, as, as your listeners probably know, uh, a, a significant risk factor for getting diabetes and heart disease and hypertension, kidney disease, all of the, all of the other chronic illnesses as well. Um, and um, yeah, so uh, there, are, there are some indications that exercise can be beneficial uh, to, to uh, improve outcomes and lower risk for, um, for breast cancer. And, um, you know, I think a, a, a lot of what women miss also is the fact that alcohol and drinking alcohol can play a significant role in uh, the occurrence of breast cancer. And let's talk about that because there's just too many people that are just so they give people a free pass with alcohol. And I am not a fan of it for any reason, regardless of what any study says. I mean, many years ago, the World Health Organization is, and that, that, I mean, people seem to care about what the WHO says. They said, we can no longer recommend any amount of alcohol is safe, any amount. And yet people like Dr. McDougall says, keep wanting good news about their bad habits. Yeah. True, I love that saying. Yeah, and there's so many people. people but he doesn't say it like that. He says, and, and there's so people, many people love to hear good news about their bad habits. Yeah, and there's right. so many people in the plant-based world that are doctors and dietitians that drink alcohol regularly and make it like, you know, it's okay. I don't think it's okay. Yeah, you know, the World Health Organization not only said, not only can they not support it, they placed it in the same category as cigarette smoking which is a class one carcinogen in its ability to uh, initiate cancer. And it's, <laughs> it's not only breast cancer, it's many cancers. It's a cancer of, you know, the entire GI tract from the esophagus to the stomach, head and neck to the colon. So um, yeah, um, you know, <laughs> look, Breast cancer is a very complex disease, and there, there are many, many factors that, that uh, probably affect its, its occurrence. And so, you know, I, I advise the patients that if, they really, if they're really serious about trying to prevent breast cancer, that they should, they, should they should look into attending to all of the possible risk factors, including alcohol including not eating you know, animal foods with saturated fat, including exercising every day, uh, including maintaining, as Dr. McDougall says, I guess he's our doctor of the day, uh, a trim, trim way, being trim, okay? So um, yeah, and, and of course we mentioned there is, there is that genetic, right, component, that factor too, but just because you have these genes, it doesn't mean they have to be expressed. You can do things. Your lifestyle, lifestyle techniques will go a long way to having them not express these genes, as Dr. Esselstyn says. We have someone watching named Laura Morris who says, breast surgical oncologist here and diplomat of the ACLM, obesity increases risk because estrogen is produced in adipose tissue. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. You know, um, the question uh, from Lily, what about ivermectin? Does it help? <laughs> um, you know, ivermectin has been in the news a lot lately because uh, people have been taking it for COVID uh, in the South. In fact, supplies of it, from what I understand, are difficult for farmers to come, come upon. Farmers 
uh, conventional farmers, animal farmers use it as parasite treatments and worm treatments in their livestock. So there's, there's no evidence that it helps COVID and I'm not aware there's any evidence that it could help breast cancer in any way. You know, I, a question I'm seeing a lot in the chat in one form or another is whether a person gets the mammogram or not, or finds out if they have cancer, do the current treatments really do anything to either extend life or improve quality of life? Well, you know, breast cancer has many, it has many different shades to it. I, I guess it depends what kind of breast cancer you have at what stage it is. Um, and, um, you know, that will, that will decide the, help to decide the outcome. So it's, you know, depends on how aggressive the tumor is. They have tumor, uh, they have uh, tumor markers that, uh, and, and calculations that can decide now the aggressivity of the tumor, of the breast cancer tumor itself. And then that can help to dictate treatment. So look, I have patients, uh, we have a lot of breast cancer patients in my practice here that I primarily treat. Um, and they, they come here to the farm seeking advice and, and help from a natural perspective because they go to, they'll go to Sloan Kettering, which is down the road from here. And they'll get a, a, one of these high high aggressivity marker, markers, and they've been told, okay, well, you have a high risk of this going from stage one to stage four if you don't take chemo. And, you know, I don't think I can necessarily argue with that. And, you know, if the, if the woman has a, a, has, a, has a high marker for aggressivity, I understand why the, why the, uh, possibility of taking this chemo should be entertained because there is data that shows that it can have it can have a have a positive impact in saving the woman's life but definitely they should be doing the lifestyle uh, lifestyle practices first and absolutely the food we have in every on almost every patient that I can ever remember who under who came here and was undergoing chemo, when they adopted a diet of whole plant foods, they tolerate their performance status, which it means the way they um, survived through the cancer treatment was excellent. Um, they did not lose weight. Uh, they did not become fatigued. You know, they had minimal side effects. Um, like neuropathy and, and other kind nausea and vomiting. And in general, they do very well. And I attribute that, that, that um, to the diet. Great, thank you. Uh, Richard asks, does excess estrogen fuel all cancers or just breast cancer? Hmm. Well, uh, we know specifically that uh, the, the, the predominant kind of breast cancer that exists is fueled by estrogen. It has re estrogen receptors on it. And that's why the main treatments around these breast cancers have been directed towards blocking the formation of estrogen uh, and blocking estrogen when it binds to the breast cancer cells to make them grow and metastasize. Um, uh, there, you know, common cancers. I'm not aware of any other that are estrogen driven. Uh, of course, in men, pros prostate cancer is testosterone driven. That's the male hormone. But um, yeah, no other major cancers. Okay, great. I saw some. Uh, Faith says, can stress increase the risk of breast cancer or other cancers? Mm. Well, uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, I'm not sure there is a lot of compelling data for that, but of course, um, you know, stress, we know it does, um, does have a negative effect on our immune system. It can make us relatively immune compromised. And if that happens, you know, that can reduce natural killer cells in our body. Natural killer cells are roving, um, like our roving uh, reconnaissance cells that 
look for developing cancer cells and try to kill them. So you want those to be at high levels. Uh, and when your immune system goes down, the natural killer cells are at lower levels. So, um, and for that reason, you know, you don't want to be stressed out. And of course, being stressed out has a lot of other attachments to it. Um, so, uh, which are negative for our health. So I would say, although I'm not sure that there are studies that, that have directly investigated this, um, it's not good to be stressed out. And that's why in lifestyle medicine, stress reduction is a major pillar of what we teach patients and have them practice every day. Absolutely. Uh, Julie Marie, who's watching live, made this comment. Treatments kill people who would survive cancer without treatment, and then it's blamed on the cancer. Healthy people survive cancer treatment, and then the credit is given to the treatment, making the data false. Yeah. Well, uh, some of what she's saying may be true. Uh, however, uh, you know, again, I have... I have seen patients who've done well when they have gotten conventional treatment. And I know that that conventional treatment, especially attached to, attached to change in lifestyle was the right thing for them. You know, my, my thing is, is one of the things I note, I, 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 I do listen to Dr. McDougall because I try to avoid doctors. I mean, unless, you know, obviously if I'm in an accident or something, because it just seems that whatever doctor you go to, whatever test, even the dentist, I don't, I always refuse those annual x-rays because they're always going to find something, you know, and, and it's like, okay. So, you know, I mean, I found out that one leg is shorter than the other. Like, so what I'm 62. What am I going to do? Have like a, like, <laughs> like, I mean, you know, why is the del the, the, the data relevant, you know? So I will go to the, you know, due diligence. If I don't go well, once in a while, I then- know, but it's tough. It's tough. Look, I get it. You know, I look, I have kids, they're 14 and 15 years old. The dentist wanted to do screening x-rays right as children and i'm thinking i don't want them to be you know these screening x-rays I, I i saw some data that maybe it could later on in life cause meningiomas like brain tumors uh and there was an association with childhood dental x-rays with that um so you know i kind of stayed away from the x-rays for a while the dental x-rays and then you know about two years ago i got a dental x-ray and they did find a small cavity that was developing in the surface of my premolar. He did. Now, if I hadn't gotten, and it was not apparent on physical exam. So if I hadn't gotten that x-ray, you know, you could make a case that it would have gone on for another year or two. And maybe, and it was under, it was underneath. You could not see it, it was underneath a groove or a, a defect or filling of the tooth, I could have ended up with a root canal or a more serious problem and potentially lost the tooth. So sometimes a lot of the things that are done in dentistry is about preserving the structure of what you have there. Because if you let it go too far, you will lose the tooth. It's about tooth preservation. Right. Well, like Dr. Lyle, who comes on the show once a month, says everything is a cost benefit analysis and people have yeah. to their own CV. For example, uh, Bond, who's a live viewer, says I've been plant based for three years and got diagnosed this year. I'm assuming she means breast cancer. Struggle with going on tamoxifen after breast conservation surgery and radiation started this past week. Am I wrong? I don't think anybody we're not trying to make people feel bad if you get right yeah. conventional treatment, your boobs, your choice. But we want people that are maybe on the fence to know that there are other. You know, when I when patients come to me, you know, most patients who come to me with breast cancer, they've already been to Sloan Kettering or the major cancer center, and they've already had the proposition of what to be done. You know, they've already gotten the mammograms. They've already gotten the biopsy. They know what it is. The workup's been done. And I say to them, do this. First of all, definitely do what I'm recommending because that's it, it has no bad side effects and it can only help you. And here, here's the data that it can actually improve your survival. Okay. Number two, go back to the professor of oncology there and say, look, I want you to tell me what are my odds? Tell me, give me the data of 
what percent, if I don't do this, what are the percentages of, of uh, what are the outcomes? What are the percentage of my dying, of my not surviving? And if I do do it, how will my percentages improve? Give me the actual percentages and tell me where it comes from. And the doctor at least owes you this. If they're recommending the treatment, they should sit down in, in plain English and explain like you're going to Vegas, right? What are my odds? Why am I doing this? Why am I making this gamble? Why am I making this bet? And if the odds sound good to you, then I would do it. If they don't, I wouldn't do it. Yeah. I'm just, I'm, I'm most doctors don't like me as their patient. Cause I question everything. And I remember when I broke my, I had a real bad accident in 2010 and I really had a bad break in my knee. It was a really bad one. I was in a wheelchair for like four months. And of course the doctor recommended surgery. And I remember I said, well, I want to get a second opinion. So I've got a second surgical opinion. And I basically said, so what are my chances of, you know, this getting better? And this is literally what the doctor said. He goes, well, either you're going to get better, you're going to get worse, or you're going to stay the same. Well, that's going to happen even if I don't have surgery. So what is the benefit of surgery? So I didn't do it. Yeah. I'm glad I did. Instead, I lost weight and, and I'm doing fine. I mean, you know, I can't, I can't run, but I didn't, didn't, never ran anyway. So yeah. it's, it's so interesting how that But works. You know, that's your particular, I guess it was your particular injury, the way that happened. You could have someone who has a, an injury in a particular way that if they didn't get surgery, they would, they would have a, a decidedly poor outcome. Right. But like, but the point of the question is, is ask, you know, don't just say, well, you know, ask this. and when go the through the says, numbers. Yeah. There and are, look, if, if the doctor is recommending you get this chemo, there are numbers, there are tests. Sure. A lot of the tests have been, have been paid for by the drug companies who made the, the chemo, but there, there are, there, there are, some studies that uh, that are the basis of his or her recommendation to you so at least get that information right well what i'm saying is is not to have not to not have surgery but that when your doctor says you have to have surgery you have to have a medication question it i believe in questioning yeah. everything and then making an we should question. yeah absolutely you know going back to diet for a minute it's one thing that they don't even a, a promote a healthy diet for prevention or as part of treatment. But that, you know, I have so many people that say, well, their oncologist said, oh, well, diet has nothing to do with it. So eat whatever you want. And I remember up until I moved here from LA three years ago, I volunteered weekly at a cancer treatment center of doing pet therapy with my dog Bailey. And we would be there for hours because the people getting infusions, they were there all day. And at lunchtime, they would come with a cart. And I'm not kidding. This is what they would give the patient. Now they would have a choice. They could have either ham and cheese on white bread or turkey and cheese on white bread. So that was their sandwich choice. Their chip choice was, of course, you know, Fritos, barbecue potato, you know, and all the different chips. And then, of course, they could have their choice of, you know, uh, Coke or 7-Up. And this is what they fed them. And because their doctor said diet makes no difference. And some of them were back for their third and fourth time having cancer. And that is just not Right. <laughs> no, it is not right, especially with the large amounts of data that are now present, which we will we will present to you guys in our webinar with Dr. Willett on Thursday. There is very compelling evidence that that is not right and and that changing your food choices make an enormous amount of difference. Yeah. I've been posting that link in the chat and it's also in the show notes if people want to sign up for the webinar. And while Dr. Willett is fantastic, he's been on the show a couple of times. Yeah. People are asking about intermittent fasting or water fasting once somebody has a breast cancer diagnosis, if it's helpful. Hmm. Well, I am not an expert on, on fasting. Um, you know, I know that, you know, intermittent fasting is, uh, can be effective for doing a number of things. Uh, Primarily, you know, it gives your body a metabolic rest so it can attend to other chores rather than constantly digesting food. Uh, uh, I'm not aware that it's that there are any major studies involving breast cancer. Probably uh, Dr. Our friends, Dr. Goldhammer uh, and Dr. Lyle would probably be uh, maybe better better position to answer that question. 
Okay, great. Um, Martika is saying, but if somebody has a tumor, do you recommend cutting it out? Well, I <laughs> again, these are these. Uh, I, I, once it is found, uh, yes. Uh, if it is a stage one tumor, if it is a stage one tumor uh, or an early stage tumor, yes, because in general, you don't know whether it's going to uh, progress into stage three and then stage four and then kill you. So, and that depends on the aggressivity of the tumor. So, you know, there are a lot of unanswered questions. All you can do is you can take the answers you're given and then make the best best decision. Great. Uh, Karen Butrick says she misses the Ethos Farm days. So little oh, shout out. If there. you redo do too, thank you. Yeah. You know, hopefully we'll be having them back in 2022. We'll try. Right. And Mart is asking about the role of fat in the diet with people that are that have cancer, and, and including the healthy plant fats. So uh, we spend a lot of time in, in our webinar discussing the fat uh, concept. The bottom line is that um, it's saturated fats that have really been shown to have a devastating impact on not only breast cancer, but a number of other cancers as well, a wide variety of cancers. And um, the um, they a lot of research has been done looking into total amount of fat uh, that women ingest regarding breast cancer, and when it comes to total amount of fat, uh, there is no clear evidence that that it impacts breast cancer in a negative way. But saturated fat, yes. Right. So why why would exercise make a difference to something like cancer? Mm. Well, um, you know, there are all kinds of, uh, we're the dawn of our understanding of how exercise affects many uh, different pathologies and chronic illness. But we do know that when people exercise, there are all kinds of myokines. There are, there are molecules that we're still finding out about that are liberating, liberated from the physical expenditure and the, the uh, process of exercising that affect other parts of your body, uh, all the way from your brain to your heart. And, um, you know, we are still investigating this, but we know there are studies that have shown that just a simple thing like walking, just 30 minutes a day, uh, had a significant impact in women's survival who had breast cancer. Yeah, great. You know, I'm, I'm wondering, going back to what we started with the men that have it, since they're not getting screenings, how are they even discovering that they have it? Is it usually because they feel a lump? Because you know, Unfortunately, it's usually when it, when it becomes so large that uh, it becomes noticeable to the man. And then they go to the doctor uh, they will get uh, a, a special kind of mammogram and then they will find it. And then usually it's, it's late stage. Yeah. Cause how did they even, I mean, squeeze it in the machine? Uh, it's difficult. It's uh, in the old days, they used to do something called a zero gram. It's not, it's a, it's, it's a difficult exam to do. Right. Thank you. Let's see. I think I just saw. Well, uh, this is just a fun question that doesn't have necessarily anything to do with cancer other than maybe that you're preventing it, but people love to know. And Stephanie's asking, what does a typical day of eating look like for Dr. Ron Weiss? You, you, you live on a farm, right? So. Well, uh, I do. Uh, and I, I don't, I didn't really expect this information, but I do have props. So um, this is our uh, kale mix that we harvested two days ago. It has a variety of different kales in it and mustards. So uh, here you go, there are mustards. Uh, and we will find out, I have our the arugula that we harvested a couple of days ago. Uh, cruciferous uh, vegetables 
have some of the most powerful evidence to back up their efficacy in improving breast cancer survival and preventing breast cancer in women. And we'll be talking about that during our webinar. Um, so I'm eating that today. I always combine these greens with a cup of what I call flaxseed and spice tea. I don't know if you guys can see this, but uh, I have freshly ground turmeric root that we grew in our hot houses and I have some other spices. And then I uh, put two tablespoons of flaxseed in here. And it's uh, like water that's heated up to about 120 degrees. I mix it up. It's very warming and delicious and all the spices and flaxseed um, combined together. And what that does is uh, when I eat the flaxseed with the greens, it helps to elevate the carotenoids to about double their concentration in the blood than if I just ate the greens alone. Now, is this a liquid or is it, I mean, these flax seeds, are they ground? Because I- It's, I mean so, it's sort of like a gruel. It's like a, it's like a thick liquid uh, that I can drink or eat with a spoon. And then, uh, I don't know, I have a, <laughs> I, I like keeping them around because they're so beautiful. And, I have um, so this delicata squash. I'll probably have that later. So we grew this in our field. This is my favorite winter squash because uh, you can just eat it just like this. And it's, it's almost one of the only ones that you can eat the entire thing, including the skin, and it is delicious. I did not know you could eat it without cooking it. I did not know that. Oh, no, 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 not without cooking it. Oh, I see. You slice it and then, then put it in the oven, but you can eat the skin. The skin is delicious. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I eat the skin on the kabocha as well. Yep. Actually, I eat the skin on the good. butternut. I, I think I eat really it. you eat the butternut. Skin? Yeah, I mean, why not? It's, yeah. I mean, I saw it's Dr. not too Greg tough for you. No, well, not when it's cooked. I saw Dr. Gregory eat the skin of a kiwi and the stem of a strawberry, and I figured, you know, I eat the stem of the cauliflower. I mean, cooked. No, I wouldn't probably. Yeah, you know, all, all these things are are you can they're edible. The question is, are they palatable? Right. So they're, they're good for you because it's just more plant fiber. I guess you have to decide whether, they're, whether it's um, palatable. Absolutely. Um, there's a question. Do you grow with hydroponic or aquaponic in your greenhouse? No, we grow in soil. We, we have a belief that uh, food grown in soil is the best food and and the most healthy food. And the reason why is because uh, a living soil determines the nutrition of the plant. Plants evolved over millions and millions of years to utilize the microbiome of the soil to assemble themselves into healthy food. Right. Uh, if people are asking about certain foods. Are they more protective against breast cancer? Like we were, I'm seeing soy in the chat. Because uh, a lot of people think that they should avoid soy. No, soy, please come to our webinar. Soy, have a, we're, we'll present a, a lot of information to you about soy. Soy is really important in the prevention and treatment of breast cancer. Yeah, uh, Dr. Barnard talks about that quite a bit. So, uh, you know, back to alcohol. So uh, there was a question about why, why is it always promoted red wine as being healthy and the blue zones are, being, are always drinking alcohol? Well, uh, alcohol, okay. Alcohol has a long history. Yeah, because when you tell back and forth. Can't, you know what happened during prohibition, you see what happened when you tell addicts they can't have their drug. <laughs> First of all, right, yeah. You know, just always remember Dr. McDougall saying people love to hear good news about their bad habits. So anytime there's just this slight hope that something could be good, it's taken and run away with uh, just a split second, because I know we're running out of time. Uh, Dr. Benjamin Rush, who signed the Declaration of Independence, who was a who, who had a, you know, who had an interesting career. Uh, he was. Uh, Benjamin Franklin's physician. Uh, and uh, one of the things he was noted for was he was the first advocate to, uh, to campaign against alcohol uh, uh, in the United States, saying that it was a dangerous substance. And this was in the early 1800s. Uh, you know, uh, since then, um, you know, th at certain times during the past couple of hundred years in America, 
there have been people recommending it for health benefits. It's dangerous. Otherwise, you know, during the during the early part of the 20th century and even before that, a lot of doctors would prescribe alcohol in tonics because they thought it was beneficial. Uh, so, um, yeah, we know that it's, it's, it's not good to drink alcohol. There's, there's a lot of evidence that, that, that says that even drinking one glass of wine three times a week increases your chance of getting breast cancer. I so, love that. I love that. Yeah. One glass and, and by the way, the reason, the, the reason why wine, that message of red wine is good for you took off was, is uh, traced back to Morley Safer from 60 Minutes. Uh, he did a, they did an episode in the, uh, around 1980 because of his love for red wine, of how there was a French paradox. And he talked about how when you go to France, uh, that French people drink a lot of red wine and that saves them from getting heart attacks and cardiac events. And after that, you see American sales of wine going, taking off 40% in that one year and it never stopped. And then doctors started climbing on the bandwagon. You know, there was messaging from, oh, red wine is heart healthy. It's not. All of that stuff was found to be false from that French, French paradox. The study was, was inadequate and actually a lot of the data from it was faulty. So the, the foundation for that message doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. I don't know. You know, are you familiar with is his name? Dr. John, I, I, he's the guy at, I want to say Stanford that does talks about how research is flawed. John Ioannidis, is that his name? Are you familiar with his work? Uh, I'm not familiar with him, but I mean, I know a study can say anything you want it to say, depending on your slant and, and, and your agenda. Yeah. So uh, what about people are asking about caffeine? I had a friend who had painful breast cysts and the doctor told her no more chocolate, no more caffeine, and she got better. Yeah. So uh, caffeine is known to increase uh, fibroadenomatous disease. You know, fibroadenomas, they're not breast cancers, but they're like enlarged glands in your breast. And, and so there's evidence that if you have, there's no direct evidence that I know of that, that caffeine causes breast cancer, but um, you know, women with, with increased fibroadenomatous disease, they have an increased incidence of breast cancer. Yeah, great. Now, I mean, we're here talking about breast cancer. There's a question on colon cancer screenings is, do you want to take it or? Yeah, sure. Okay. I'm a primary doctor and this is what I right. do all day. Well, well, speaking about you being a primary doctor, like people can have consults with you, right? I mean, even, or do they have to live in New Jersey or New York? Um, uh, well, I'm licensed in New Jersey, New York. Uh, if, you know, we try to help everyone. If people, we do take care of people in other states. Um, so sure, uh, you know, um, we, make a, we, make a, we make arrangements to do that uh, where we bring in other colleagues to help with that because I'm not licensed in 48 of the 50 states, only New Jersey and New York. So right. we, we work with people to do that. Right. But um, as far as colon cancer screening, yeah, I do believe people should, <laughs> I do believe people should be screened for colon cancer. Okay. Well, Richard's uh, saying that um, he has an inguinal hernia and he's hoping to avoid surgery. Doctor suggested he use Cologuard, so not to aggravate the hernia. Do you typically suggest colonoscopies or do you agree in certain circumstances Cologuard might be better? Uh, I, I do agree that col Cologuard can be an acceptable test. And uh, for people who are not, who, who do not want a colonoscopy um, or who, who are not clear, on what they want, I think Cola Guard is perfectly acceptable. Great. Well, Dina just said she just purchased the event, so it's terrific, guys. I've been posting Wonderful. a link. Just click on it. It's going to be amazing. It's very, very. It uh, will be. Uh, I, I don't think you guys realize that Doc, Dr. Walt Willis, a, a real heavy hitter in the world. No. This will be an amazing event. Yeah, and actually, I just wanted to say the nice thing about this webinar is, for the first time in the past couple of years, we finally have data at studies that really show um, that 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 reveal uh, that 
the quality of whole plant-based diets is that it makes a difference in the the prevention and increased survival of breast cancer. You know, a lot of the old studies, they would talk about, oh, they had a vegan diet or they had a vegetarian diet. But as you know, Chef AJ, you can't just say someone's a vegan or eating a plant-based diet. It can mean many things. So, uh, and a lot of these studies that he'll be talking about in the evidence were studies that were done by by, uh, Walter Willett himself. So we'll really get a bird's eye view of the importance of this data. Great. And uh, there's a question, what time is the virtual event Thursday? Uh, see, people are asking me in their time zone in Central. I, I don't know. I only know what time it is in your time zone because that's how we listed it. Yeah, well, I guess Central is what? Uh, one hour behind us, Mount, Rocky Mountain, they call it Mountain Time or Rocky Mountain, two hours and, and Pacific Time is three hours, so. So it's 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 what time are you doing it Thursday where you live, which is Eastern? Oh, let me see. Uh, is it six? Th- Boy, I should know this. Is it six thirty or seven? If they click on the click on the link, they'll find the, it's either six thirty or seven Eastern time. Right, I'm going to click. You on click the on the link. Uh, you'll it'll bring you to the website and all the information is there. Okay, I'm trying. Uh, here it is. It's six thirty Eastern, which means it was yeah. it would probably be five thirty. Central Done. and three thirty Pacific, and would it be recorded for somebody that maybe can't make it? Uh, you know, I am so I am uh, primitive in my technological skills, but I will I will talk to our tech team and ask if that's possible. Yeah, that that would be I guess important to know because for Pacific time, maybe some people might still be yes, working three thirty p.m. and uh, that so that would be fantastic if it. And might. if you have questions like that. If you if you uh, if you contact our team, they can. If you have a request like that, I'm sure they'll be. If it's possible to accommodate you, they'll they'll find a way to do that. Great. And anything else you want to mention or talk about while we have you here, which is so nice. I think uh, I think it's time for me to start eating my kale. Yeah. Great. Well, maybe you'll post a recipe for your morning. What you call it? Not slurry. You called it gruel. Yeah, my my black seed spice gruel. <laughs> That's really really. Well, I'll give it to you right now. It's just two tablespoons of flax seed, and then I I just put in a, a scoop of like a tablespoon or so of shredded, um, grated fresh uh, turmeric root, maybe uh, a couple of teaspoons of fresh grated ginger root, and then uh, maybe a little cinnamon dash of cinnamon in there. I throw a little dash of cardamom and uh, grind a black pepper. Terrific. I, Adina says, can she drive down from Canada to visit the farm? Is it open yet in terms of? Uh, well, we still, so we have a farm or market. It's called the doctor's farm market. It's open to the public. If you go to our website, ethosfarm.org, uh, you will find out about it. We have uh, our farm market is seasonal. Um, and uh, we're open probably the way the weather looks here for another couple of weeks. Um, if you're interested, we, this Saturday, we do have an exciting event on the farm, which involves, includes um, um, activities in mindfulness, uh, fitness, nutrition, and also I'll be giving a little talk on the reasons to go plant-based. And we have a wonderful farm to fork lunch that's included and you can find that out on the website mm. dina says what are your what are your go-to kitchen gadgets they don't want you to leave you know I, i'm i'm not a gadget you know i'm a primitive person i eat with my hands basically um i'm, I'm not a chef i don't uh, suppose to be um if i can get a can opener to work i'm ahead of the game that's great. Well, thank you. I, I, I'll rely on you to make those recommendations. <laughs> Instant Pot. Yeah. That's- Instant Pot. That's as high tech as I get. Yeah. Well, good. That's fine. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Weiss. It's always a pleasure reconnecting with you. Thank you, Jeff. AJ. It's been a pleasure to talk. Same here. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back in 45 minutes when we have another fabulous show. We have Chef Lena and she's going to be making a spinach pesto. Take care, Dr. Weiss. Bye-bye.